Hello, so if this video goes up, well honestly I'm recording it first thing in the morning because I'm still feeling a bit less than me, honestly. Um, uh, I do not recommend having flu jab, a week later COVID jab, and having had what can only be described as a let's say a version of, I don't know, my food poisoning, stomach upset, whatever you want to call it. Um, in between, I, I, it really doesn't leave you in the greatest condition. Add that with having, and always a joy of life, the fact you do uh, rejections from job applications, eh, it happens. To be fair, to be honest, some of the rejections have been really nice. So we'll leave that to one side. And, um, well, I'm not really working as far, I'm being more, even more fussy than I normally am when it comes to work even more, more, and more fussy than I normally am when it comes to work. And, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if today, if the building of the of Trafalgar will end up going out today or whether it will go out tomorrow. It might well get recorded again today. It's already been recorded twice today. Um, but, um, yeah. Ferrari. It might not. So I thought I would have a bit of a preparatory discussion before I get on to the future of strategy, etc. when I'm just doing this. Because I've been experimenting that video for about the last two and a half months. And it's an interesting video. It really is. Where are my instructions? There are my instructions. Shall I actually read this? Probably will. Probably will. There you go. And I did promise I'd be doing this, and you all voted that I would be doing this, and I was planning on doing this on Monday as a way to relax, but honestly on Monday, I was not really good. And it wasn't helped by someone who will remain nameless. Someone who will remain nameless. Deciding to try and eat something which he shouldn't have done. Dogs. In fact, it's, I have to admit, on the Trafalgar one, it's got to the level that as you can see in the background, I've got I'm rewriting it. But to no, uh, talking about the the future of strategy, etc. And um, to explain what measure of trickery I am using for this current procedure. There you go. I have a, I'm using one of my portable camera stands that I use when I'm on the trip with the uh, Shipshape crew. And it's being oh when I'm recording in Portsmouth. Which is probably now going to be December. Seriously. You have to let one off. Oh good god, silent but deadly. Only a poodle. Only a poodle. Oh. Oh my goodness gracious me. I know I haven't fed you anything which should cause that. Will you stop eating strange stuff and trying to drink from strange places? Please. I, you can claim you're gorgeous all you like, but, you know, nicest way. No. 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 That, you can wag your tail now. You wag your tail now to disperse it, but, you know, you could have done that earlier. I don't know. Yes, I know. You're not sure which camera to look at, are you? You don't know. Which is your camera to focus on? The fact that you do not need, that you in true poodle form do not need to be taught that you know you focus on a camera is really quite worrying. <sighs> down. Go on, down. Go to sleep. Stop farting. Good boy. I'll leave you everyone there. So, why is the future of strategy so intriguing? Well, because of three different technologies we have coming through. Three different technologies. And honestly, working out how I'm going to explain some of them is intriguing me. I might actually even use a Lego assembly, i.e. the assembly of the, poor, of the Porsche behind me as part of it. Why? Because you have three things affecting strategy. Three things that guide all strategy. One, 
the risk of human life, i.e. how much what value you place on human life is going to affect your strategy. How uh, how much you value your pe your people. Uh, you know, whether life is cheap or life is expensive, in your opinion, is going to have an impact on what strategy you adopt. It is. It always does. But, the other thing that always affects strategy, that is a physical description, what you can build and where you can build it. Resource management, logistics, sustainment. These things have a real impact on your capability to, to actually operate. And finally, the third factor, cost. All of it. All of it is a cost on society. All of it is an impact you have to deal with. Do I want to assemble the human first? I might as well assemble the human first. That is their request. So I will follow their request. So, what am I talking about? What am I discussing? Well, the whole thing really boils down to one small problem. As we develop 3D printing, as we develop all sorts of technologies, we become less and less affected by logistics. Let me explain that before people start jumping on and going, Oh, yes, but what about maintaining the 3D printers? Yes. But the thing is, you can now assemble components. And the more and more components you can assemble where you are, the more and more what you're looking at is supplies of base materials. And the problem has always been, the advantage of picking off logistics has always been never going after the whole logistics train. It's been picking off base materials. In World War II, the big focus was to attack fuel supplies. The big focus was to attack ball bearings. The big focus was to attack the small things, which are frigating annoying that you have to move backwards and forwards to supply your logistics and industries. And if all you have to do is supply materials in their base form so they can 3D print the parts they need as and when they require, it changes things dramatically. It also means that one very small annoying part that you never have enough of. You no longer have that problem. You will have enough of, enough of it. You just print it. It can be printed from the base materials. So you print it and you manufacture it. And yes, we are not there yet. Please note, I'm not saying we're at the point where that's coming. Uh, well, well, where that is here. But we are at the point where that has to be is coming and we have to start thinking about it. We well, have to start considering what are the likely options going to be. What is going to happen? Because it will happen. That's going to affect things. It's going to affect how you deal with opponents. In many ways, it's going to balance the field, but also completely debalance the field. Because those who are larger powers will probably get even larger, will have even more capabilities. Will have any have even be even stronger than they are now because they will be able to invest in these materials and grow themselves appropriately to use it. That will be their advantage. Now this doesn't mean that the same old pinch point of energy fuel is not going to uh, going to apply to forces it's still going to be there it's still going to be a major factor but it will mean now you will probably be, for want of a better phrase limited to worrying about energy and mass you could end up being longer term and this won't be this will not be an instantaneous change one of the things that's often quite difficult to explain to people this is you know is it's going to be a transition that the idea of instantaneous changes especially on play things like the battlefield they just don't happen there is some chances of them happening there's always a chance of them happening but it's very unlikely i think that actually 
actually goes underneath. Yes, that looks more correct. And this is the point at which we really have to start to think things through, because if things are going to take time to happen, if they are not going to happen overnight, that means there's probably going to be transitions in terms of capabilities. There's going to be transitions in terms of the reality of warfare. And this is going to have an effect on strategy. This is going to have an effect on our, how we deter conflict. Especially once you put it factor into the next thing. Drones. Uncrewed warfare. The fact that we can now distance humans more than ever from the realities of conflict. We, we can't do it 100%. And please note, I'm not saying it's anywhere near there yet. We've already noticed something different taking place. We've already noticed something where there's a change. That change? Drones getting shot down by major powers and no one responds. It's just the cost of doing business. It's not even a major thing. It's definitely not a casus belli because after all no one was killed. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But that's a change. It's a big change. It means there are now systems which are frontline systems and frontline systems used as part of presence and deterrence which are. Not just expendable, but expendable to the extent that they don't count if they are lost. This has a whole new level of diplomatic signaling and a whole new level of risk, because especially with the development of optionally man, optionally crude, as the phraseology goes, optionally crude systems. Because if a system can be optionally crude, and you've got into the habit of shooting down, being able to shoot down things to send a statement of the un uncrewed things. At what point does the defence become, we presumed it wasn't crewed when we shot it down, we do apologise? Or does the announcing that you're crewing these systems, that they actually have humans aboard, is that adding another level of signalling? Is that sending a message of the sincerity of your approach, of the severity of the situation that you are judging it? It will add a whole lot, a whole lot of layers and perspectives to these operations. It will need to. It has to. And you couple those two things together, that you can basically build as many as you like, almost, as near enough, because it, you are going to be able to sustain those numbers, so they're replaceable. And you add those things together with the reality that no one cares if it gets shot down, if it gets destroyed, and it's still peace. And suddenly you have a real problem with deterrence, and a real problem with the whole grey area of warfare. And then you have a further problem on that, because the more and more we get used to the idea of war taking place at a distance, the more and more that's what the public, especially, are going to be, in terms of their cultural memory and understanding of conflict, are going to be conditioned to expect a war to be like. So the more and more it is going to be 
a traumatic event should lives be lost. And for opponents who are, let's put it this way, uh, less enamoured with the value of human life, or rather, less worried with spilling their opponent's human life, then that can represent opportunity, for want of a better phrase. They can factor that into their analysis and go, well, if we cause them a cost of life, they'll be so shocked that they will surely surrender, surely give in. Now, you could point to history and you could go, well, actually, so far, the reality has been every time someone has shocked someone, used that sort of methodology, what has resulted has been absolute and total war and a pretty much never-ending conflict until, it's, uh, until one side thinks they have done enough to ensure it never happens again, the side that's been attacked. You can make that case. You wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but you can make... But... Look at these little Ferraris. But still, it's an attractive idea for someone. It's an attractive idea for someone who wants to think they're different. And the trouble is, a lot of people like to believe their own Kool-Aid. They like to believe their own propaganda, their own myth. They are different. They are something special. The reality is very few of us are anything special or anything different. But leave that to one side. We're all fundamentally humans. We all fundamentally have ten digits. So therefore we tend to think in terms of, well, these days we think in terms of ten. Um, of course, in ancient times we sort of counted knuckles, so we fought in, well, usually in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So, base fourteen is usually... Uh, although some societies developed a base nine structure because they didn't count the ones on there. Um, and there are others as well. Please note, I am a historian, but mm, that is an article I read a long, long time ago, and it's not really my area of history, so, you know. But it was interesting. It was interesting to think about. And so, we have these scenarios potentially turning up. Where we could have opponents thinking one of two things. One, they can shoot down uncrewed systems with impunity. And it's not going to be war. No one's going to bring the in mobilize the entire force. No one's going to let loose, in current US terminology, the raptors. Because they've shot down a drone. Because, let's be honest, justifying the cost, let alone the loss of life that might come about from doing such an action, based on losing a drone, is kind of a difficult one to justify. You can understand where this is coming from. It, it's, it's, yeah. You are going to risk human lives over a machine, an expendable asset. Yeah. It makes sense. But saying that, and I know I'm saying this, I'm saying a lot of things, but saying that in specifically, at a certain point, if someone's able to keep attacking your machines and your systems with impunity without you doing anything in response... You can end up with another problem coming about. They can end up judging that the reason you're not doing anything in response is because you're scared of them. 
not because you don't value the very machines that you're using, especially if they look at these machines and they see them as advanced and highly capable systems, and yet you do nothing to defend them. You do nothing to defend yourself and your capabilities. What am I saying? I'm saying that, honestly, this stuff is all going to make the world a lot more complicated. A lot more complicated. Because for larger powers, especially those who are more capable, have more force, have more technology to mobilize, and can you are prepared, to, uh, are happier to sort of mobilize their economy rather than necessarily their population, happier with the concept of risking one thing rather than the other, well, they could find themselves playing a very problematic game, I think. Yes, that is the ones with the black in the middle, isn't it? It is. They all have black in the middle. Okay, that makes sense. That's good. Sorry. Um, some of these things are incredibly detailed. Which becomes a problem. Because there is a reverse calculation that goes on. If your entire risk of war is machines, your entire risk of war is not even mobilizing your uh, populace, but basically playing some sort of advanced war game. Well, that can cause an issue. That can cause a lot of issues. It can make it very tiny decal. It can make it so that the words of Arthur Wellesley, that the only thing worse than a battle won is a battle lost, gets forgotten gets ignored, gets put to one side and people think, well, you know, that doesn't matter. That isn't a problem for us to deal with. That isn't a problem for us to worry about. You know, war has no risk for us. And then you have a real problem, because if war has no risk, and if war is felt to have no risk for you, then you can end up lumbering into some really stupid situations. You can end up creating situations which otherwise you would have avoided, because it's a risk which you have to think through. If you think it's going to cost you, not be, you know, it's nothing your economy can't bear, it's incredible, it, it, war is not going to be any kind of tax on your population, it's not going to be anything you have to worry about. The potential, the risks,
that becomes just tremendous. And so, that is really one of the things I'm trying to um, work through at the moment. I'm trying to work through when talking about future, uh, potential of future conflict, etc. And the realities that could come about. I'm trying to work through the likelihood of us reaching that point. Of us reaching a point at which we both value human life so greatly that its loss is going to shock us, and yet we believe war to be of such slight and minute cost that we ignore the consequences of our own actions or inactions. Now, I am, as said, working through this video. I have been working on it for a lot of time, and I have actually worked with a sort of tried to experiment with a few computer games to see if they might be the sensible things for me to use. Um, there are different games which have different capabilities, and it's worthwhile considering them all as potential options, but also considering what those potential options might be. What those potential values might be. And again, this is an interesting area to get into because computer games are becoming more and more a viable scenario for people like me to work out what some of the best and the brightest of the world around us think about war. Now, yes, I do not agree that they are a 100% realistic scenario. I am not going to start making those claims. I'm also not going to start making a claim that computer games necessarily reflect all the best of thinking and necessarily have the capacity to reflect all the best of thinking. They just don't. Be nice if they did, but they do not. They cannot. They do not have the necessary... Well, the nicest way the world they're built to, uh, to engage with is largely the, uh, the world with the individual. Not necessarily the world of the collective, or the world of the wider organization. But still... They do represent some level of... This is where it could go. This is where people envisage it could go. And also, the thing is, computer games have to present a level of realism. They have to have an internal logic which stands up. Even if they, their logic doesn't stand up to external analysis and external argument, they have to stand up internally. Because otherwise... Very quickly, they become very boring. It becomes a scenario where people are going, um, but it doesn't. This doesn't make sense with all the rest of the stuff you you put in there. Why is this work like this? Why is this happening? And because we say so in the game, doesn't tend to work well long term. In fact, long term, that can cause itself its own troubles. That's fairly straight. So. I'm looking for number six. That's number six. So what does this all mean? 
what does all of this discussion mean? What does all this equate to? In terms of what we're looking at, in terms of what we're thinking, in terms of what could happen in the world. Honestly? We don't really know. We don't. We'd like to claim we know. We'd like to claim we know where everything's going to go. We'd like to claim we know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, you know, we're like we can predict the future. There are all those people who are various, very smart people who like to go, well, we've looked at the data and the future's going to do this or the future's going to do that. And this is where historians like me get particularly, um, and I put this politely, uh, particularly, um, <laughs> humoured. I'm not saying we laugh at them. We don't. That would be cruel. Uh, what we tend to do is we tend to listen to their statements and go, but so far, throughout history, every time someone has made a major bet on something and has said, this is the future, the future is going to be this way, they have been wrong. In fact, it's wrong with 100% accuracy. Every single time, they have been wrong. And, again, there is nothing bad about that. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with being wrong. It's, there's nothing wrong with thinking about the future and hoping to be right. And I, There are people who have been right in certain regards. I remember one person... Uh, wrote a paper predicting that the future all money would be without would be digital would be without physical form. Um, I actually went to school with the young man who was the grandson of the gentleman who made that prediction, and it was a really really cool prediction. However, I point out. Cash is still in use. It was supposed to be entirely cashless, physical cashless society by, I think, the year 2000? Or 2023. I still use cash to buy my bottle of iron brew at the, at the um, corner shop. We use these things more than ever. We do. So please do not get me wrong. He's not, he was not wrong. It's just... My Ferrari is slightly out of alignment, but otherwise okay. Um, just... The world is different. And that's mainly because when you are making such predictions, when you are coming up with such ideas, usually you are looking at history as a straight line. You are looking at a nice predictable graph. You're going, yeah, we can do all these things. The reality is, history, humanity, has never been a straight line graph in its entire history. It's one of my other big problems with certain other systems which are bound today, and I'll be getting into those in other videos. Um during the Christmas period, because there are certain ideas going around which already worry me enough when it comes to when it comes to understanding warfare, when it comes to understanding conflict, and predicting conflict, and predicting the nature of the casualties you're going to sustain in conflict, and that we have various systems We have various systems in our world and various models in our world which are used to try and predict things. And lots of the stuff that's based on those predictions are treated as if they're not predictions but are fact, are certainties must come to pass because, after all, it has been predicted to be so. 
so there is no chance of it being anything else. That is a very scary, scary idea. Because if you're saying a prediction must come to pass because it cannot be anything else, nothing else can happen other than this prediction. Well, there is a very old saying, when men plan, gods laugh. Slightly more modern saying is often the plans of mice and men uh, the plans of mice and men often go awry. That is true. Why? Because, on paper, you can account for every potentiality, every possibility, every conundrum, and you can uh, get, make allowances for it, and therefore you can be certain you're going to be right. And then when it comes to turning that paper into reality, well, you have a, just a small issue, just a, a, a tiny issue, really in that the enemy gets a vote. You have to account for not only what you want to do, uh, you will do, but also what the enemy will do. And the enemy might not necessarily do the most sensible thing. They might have capabilities which you don't know about because your intelligence failed. There's all sorts of scenarios which can infect and affect the outcome of an operation. They could be completely and utterly moronic, okay? There is always a possibility they are going to be completely moronic. And this is another problem when you get into a scenario where you are doing this sort of, where you're sort of thinking about war as a distant act. Because we can look through certain nations' histories and we can go, the one thing you really do not want to do to this nation is attack them by surprise and hurt civilians. You just don't want to do those things. Those things are very, very stupid. Don't do them. Leave it be. Um, do something else with your time. Preferably something elsewhere. And a different time, a different place, a different substance. But the thing is, if you think that country is not going to react, if you're basing your entire basis on belief of, well, they just send drones and we destroy those and they don't do anything about it, so if we want to win this, we want to crush them, all we have to do is attack them, and they will fall apart. Because they're so weak, all they do is send drones. And you can hear some... You can, If you think about it, you can hear some... Well, how about I sorry? Bright, ideaed individual who has a cunning, cunning plan... Probably also a professorship in Cunning from Cunningham University. Going just that idea. Because let's be honest, again, the same countries have been attacked multiple times in the past by people with that idea. If it had happened once, you could say, well, that was a simply a misguided person. But once people have done it, not just once, but twice, but multiple times, 
against not that country, but all those countries, but also sometimes their allies. You sit there and go, hang on, what's happening here? Why is this? Ooh. There is something weird in this tire. Oh no, they all got the same weird. So that's going to be the in part, internal part of the tire. Yeah, internal part definitely. Because I don't want that on the outside. It make it look weird. Anyway, and if people are wondering what I'm talking about, there's this little sort of blemish on the tire, which is obviously a mold mark. Um, you know. It, if they keep coming back to the same idea, because that's the only option they can come with for actually being able to win it. You have to expect it to accent happen again. And someone is going to have the same bright idea, because they will be different from the others. They will be different. They are different. They are more committed. They have more purpose. They have XYZ advantage. Someone always has some amazing advantage. They are sure is going to make the difference and mean they're going to win. They know they will win. No one has else a chance against them. They know they will win. And yet, the reality is, they won't. The reality is, often, that they can't. That the consequences, if they win, are great enough that the other side would face total destruction of their position, of their living standards, of whatever, if they allow themselves to lose. So therefore, they won't lose. And considering you're already adopting a surprise attack, that means they're probably stronger than you to begin with. And if they're stronger than you to begin with, and they are sufficiently motivated, you don't win. Now, usually at this point, when I'm talking about countries which have been repeatedly attacked out of surprise by other nations, people usually think, oh, you must be referring to America, but there's actually more than just America. There are other major countries which have had the same issues, repeatedly. Because this is a, continu this is a continuing bright idea, and this is what really worries me. Because it's a continuing bright idea, and because of the nature of future warfare... As I see it. Because that's what fits with not just the trends, but also our growing idea of what warfare will be like. Distributed warfare. There's always a reason that the sequel of the the weapon systems in in the Star Wars trilogy, uh, Star Wars video uh, uh, movies seem to go back. They start off with battleships in terms of the Star Destroyers, and then they go to return the carriers. Because they're very much looking at a World War II motif, and the battleships were still the most powerful assets you can possibly imagine as an individual ship-killing ship system. Even in that period. Yeah, they have missiles and all those things, but yeah, the battleships were still... They were still, in the minds of many of the senior people who were making those decisions, They had in their, when they had grown up in their youth, the battleships, the images of them, they were these powerful vessels. And it fits in the psyche and the memory. And 
that's not a bad thing, because as I've pointed out you know, on this channel many, many times, the battleship is not a bad system. It's a very good system at killing other ships. The pro it can still actually, could still actually kill carriers. The question is, can it get within range of the carrier to kill them? And that's the whole point of the air wing. And therefore, the carrier's strength depends on the air wing. Which is why it's really silly to not invest properly in your air wing. But we'll leave that to one side. There are always people willing to try and... Um, how do I put this politely? Make me feel smart. By not doing the sensible thing. And not investing in their air wing. And then going... Ah, we don't know why this doesn't... Uh, we don't... The enemy can now outrange us. Ah, we're all surprised. And you're sitting there going... No, you're not surprised. You are just not listening and being a bit of a moron. But leaving that to one side... Leaving that to one side... That is the other really interesting thing when we start to talk about the future of war, because... If you think about having operating drones and operate and being able to manufacture vessels, etc., manufacture systems, you're looking at some pretty big space consuming assets, which actually means probably vessels not as dissimilar to aircraft carriers. Which is why probably the two asset the two systems I was looking at, the two games which were really um, Featuring in my mindset when I was thinking about what to do or what to build in terms of what to use to help me illustrate with the video coming up are um, Supreme Commander, obviously enough, and Carrier Commander Gaia missions. I think it's called. Let me. I always get. Uh, I was. You see, the trouble is, I played it when it was many, many, many floppy disks. And then they came up with a new one. So it's Supreme Commander is one of them. And the other one is Carrier Command Gaia Mission. Now, they are both interesting, interesting games. But both of them revolve a lot around distributed force creation. And creating task forces of automated, uncrewed assets. Very capable assets, but uncrewed assets. Now, there is nothing wrong with being an uncrewed asset. In fact, it's a very viable system to go for. Especially, and it fits with what quite a lot of modern development is heading towards. But, again, there is a difference. And I notice this even with myself. When I am commanding those assets, and I know they are uncrewed... Versus, even in terms of game, and immer uh, this is where I suppose game immersion comes in. To make sure I get those right. Knowing that they're uncrewed, my strategies change. The risks I'm prepared to take with those assets. If I lose them, I lose them. I'm not really bothered. I can rebuild more. And I will rebuild more. Lots more. To the extent that my opponent will n always, always find themselves fighting a tremendous amount of force. That's sort of my basic strategy. I never said it was an enhanced strategy. I never said it was a, it was a clever strategy. But the basic strategy is numbers. And there are advantages to that. But it also changes the entire scenario from what I need to protect. If you're looking at aircraft ca aircraft carrier um, carrier command Gaia mission, you always have to defend the carrier. The carrier is your cri principal, uh, principal asset, your critical asset. As long as you have your carrier, everything else is doable. Unfortunately, you don't have onboard manufacturing facilities for your components. You do for quite a lot of things, but not for your components. You have them off-boarded onto various islands, which you then order up from uh, using the resources you have acquired. And you 
build them, you get them to your carrier by means of um, delivery submarine. In Supreme Commander, well, your Supreme Commander unit is the only crewed unit. That's the unit you have to maintain. That system has the ability to advance itself, but also has the ability to manufacture factories, etc., and other buildings, create them, and generally can make itself felt on the battlefield. You can also do a range of other upgrades. I like tend to like the teleporting one, because that allows me to pop up at random spaces around the battlefield. And... Well, interact with things. <sighs> Others prefer other assets, including various forms of missile launcher. And one of the quickest ways to actually get yourself a decent game is to turn off the strategic game enders, because otherwise, for everyone just races for nukes and then starts lobbing nukes at each other. And I mean, really, just lobbing nukes at each other. It turns down into a very boring game in regards. It basically becomes entirely about who can fire the most nukes, which can saturate the other person's anti-nuke defense. <sighs> it's especially fun when you have other game enders like large multi-scale artillery units. But there again, you can even have portable factories in it i.e. systems which can defend themselves, fight, and also create other units. They're actually autonomous units themselves. It's one of those scenarios which is really fun when you think about it, in that you have an autonomous unit together that can build other autonomous units. But then that means you really are ending up in networks of networks of networks of systems of systems of systems. And that's going to create its own other issues because with that level of distributed command and control it becomes viable that someone, perhaps a different actor, could take control of your assets and use them to carry out an attack or to orchestrate what you are, take over what you are doing. And that's really not good. They could take over and control everything, theoretically. After all, that's the whole point of hacking, and then you end up in a sort of well, for want of a better, ray, uh, a better phrase, a brain race going on between hacking abilities. And the trouble is with that sort of race. The issue with that sort of race. is that, very quickly, the race can be hijacked by people who normally would be outsiders because of the methodologies they are prepared to employ. You can think about that, but if literally the world's capabilities can spin on one person who's considered the world's best hacker to affect the outcome of a battle. What would you be prepared to do if you're a, if you're even a minor power, let alone a major power, to ensure that you had control over that resource, to ensure that that resource answer to you and you alone what would you be prepared to do 
And again, this is in a scenario where we're talking about it, where the value of life has been, in many ways, degraded by the reality of the situation everyone is operating in. Or rather, the value of life has gone up, but the threat of war has gone down, and therefore the value of life for some actors has gone down. That's a little bit of a weird stuff, so if I'm not making sense, let me rephrase that. So, Let's say this. Power Y is smaller than power X, which is also smaller than power Z. Power Z has forces patrolling to protect itself and its corridor. Power X is has a lot more resources than power Y and a lot more facilities, but is not anywhere near matching up to power Z. Now, power X could know that power Y has a very good hacker in them, a very good computer person. And they could say, well... Let's co-opt that personality, that person, however they might, achieve, might decide to go about that methodology, and use them to attack Power Z's systems, to get Power Z systems to attack us, blame X, and use Power Z's upset at, lo at uh, lo loss of life, that they, instead of doing the work required to work out what has actually happened will just attack power X. Because, let's put it this way, if you've designed systems which you cannot get back control of if they've been hacked, you really shouldn't be using those systems. I don't, I do not countenance the fact that some people will not design such systems. I'm, I'm sure someone will have a bright idea and will claim this system is unhackable so we don't need some system, or that if we include a back door which allows us to take over in case we're hacked, that will be the very nature of this back door will mean that we will be hacked through that back door. I can hear their arguments now. But leaving that all to one side. You should always have some sort of system on those uh, on those functions. But they might not. They might not. And the reality is, under that scenario, you could end up with a war breaking out, being fought by Z's forces against X, or rather... Z's forces attacking Y, them feeling massively guilty for it, and therefore pummeling X. False flag operations. Again, nothing new. That is the other point I'm trying to make in this or quite a lot of this analysis. There is nothing really new about what we're talking about. There is nothing really unusual. And yes, this is a rather long discussion while I am building a Lego car. But I was thinking about this anyway. And as said, I'm going to be re-recording again. <laughs> my Trafal I'm rewriting the uh, PowerPoint for Trafalgar, and then I'm going to re-record it again. Because, yeah, that's me. That's what I do. And because it fits with my timing. At the moment, I have the time, so I might as well do it. 
think I'm getting these wrong in terms of the construct instructions. Let's do that. And that is correct. Sometimes this stuff is really, really tiny. Between that one, not that one, and that one, and then I want number twenty one. Number twenty one, and you will go there, and I'm guessing, just guessing. this will go here. And what do you know it does? Okay, let's do the next one, which I'm presuming is going to be the other side. Can you guess what it is yet? Um, yeah, da -da -da. You are going to go here. You here. And you here. Because that's probably right. Right. Da -da -da. So. Future of Warfare and Strategy. Strategy has to take all these things into account. Strategy. This is why I say future strategy hasn't yet been written. Because whilst it will no doubt draw a lot from the lessons of the past, it will no doubt have all sorts of factors in it. All sorts of thoughts in it. That are informed by past experience, are informed by past thinking. It will also have to take, uh, take into account the changing... not nature of war, because I don't, un I, I don't tend to agree with the idea of warfare changing its nature. Um, our sensibilities about warfare change, but warfare itself doesn't change. It's just it's what we believe is a acceptable practice in it changes, but that doesn't necessarily change its nature, it's still there the beast is still there it's just we like to pretend we have control of the beast um, again I'm not too enamoured with that idea, I don't think we control these things as much as we, I don't think we ever have the power to really control it I don't think we ever will have the power to really control it, because at the base point you're always talking about these things when you're making rules you tend to be making them in rules in peacetime, when everyone is happy and nice and no one's being pressed, no one's being scared, no one's in fear of losing. And there are things you can lose which are far worse to lose than your life. Now, there really are. So, yeah. And it's nearly finished, so I will finish this off in front of you. And I'll probably leave it going while I'm doing it. But, yeah, it's... It's been an interesting subject to work around and to think through and to try and work out how best to approach it and how best to reflect it and examine it. Because... 
A lot of our understanding of war, and a lot of modern understanding of conflict especially, is rooted in our belief in how people should act and how humans will react. But the trouble is, a lot of that belief, especially when you're coming from the West, when you're coming from the background we all have, or rather, the background I have, I'm not sure if all my listeners have this, I hope they don't, I hope they are spread out a bit, is that you have to get past automatically presuming everyone views the world through the same lenses as you do. They don't. Their analysis of the opportunities of systems could be very different than your analysis, because what they're prepared or what they understand about those systems or advantages they glean from those systems can be different. Their ideas of what it can allow them to do, what it will allow them to do, can be different. And that's not to say they're going to be bad or good. Just different. And that sometimes is a very strange word to use because so, lots of people try to uh, add things, put things onto the word different. I, when someone is using different, they're trying to mean it's lesser or not as good as. And honestly, that isn't. When you are spending as much time in a topic as most academics do, and most people who are interested in most topics do, different becomes just that. It says it's not the same as another uh, as X or Y. I often get into this trouble when I say some things are, oh, they're just as good as each other. They're just you're doing it from a different way, and people insist, to, oh, but you've, there's got to be one which is better than the other. No, there doesn't. There really doesn't need to be one which is necessarily better than the other. It would make life easier if there was, but the fact is, there doesn't. Saying one has to be better than the other, well, that's making an assumption of similar values and similar standing and similar purpose, and therefore then doing a comparison between their their values, their purpose, and their standing. And you sit there and go, well, hang on, no, these are incredibly different systems. These systems are completely different. They're metric for what they would be in terms of being successful is completely different. You cannot therefore start going and comparing them and go, well, this one is better than the other one. It's not. Unless they're designed to do exactly the same job under exactly the same circumstances, you really shouldn't make that comparison. It's a fun one to make. It's a fun one to sometimes go, you know, who's got doing a better capital ship for their mission, uh, for, you know, which one's more powerful battleship and all those things. It is fun, but in terms of actual knowledge of conflict and what would happen, it doesn't really teach you much. It's also where it gets really interesting in terms of trying to work out the specific values of things i.e. whether or not something is more useful than something else. Well, you have to describe system values to what they're supposed to be doing. That's why I really enjoyed doing the whole um, analysis of capital ships. Uh, the video I did not that long ago, actually, on the channel. Yes, that one goes in there. Because going through the capital ships in science fiction and going, hmm, which one is really 
the most useful meant first of all I had to uh, look at their settings and compare them across and, and assign values through their settings i.e. what are they required to do in the setting what's x what's y what are they doing that caused me fun because of course lots of people disagree with me and I enjoy it when people disagree with me a bit gives me a bit of stuff to you know talk about and think about and learn from also hopefully teach from Now that goes down to that, and then I'm going to guess we have even more of these going on. <laughs> Cute. So this is a very cool design. I have to admit that. Well, I'm glad you all selected the Ferrari because that's been a fun build. It has been a fun build. And I get a cork Ferrari out of it. And next time I get a Porsche. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm going to guess that's going to do that. So now I can line up things. So. Oof. First off. This one gets lined up. I'm going to end up with a higgledy piggledy line this right. Uh, it's about right. I don't like to take stickers off once they've been applied, so I hope I get it right first time. If I don't, well, if they take you take them off, then they start, then they tend to lose their stick and fall off and on again. This is just my personal view. Please note, I am nowhere near a professional um, modeler or any of those people. They are. I watch them sometimes, and I am absolutely amazed by their capabilities. Yeah, that's all right. That's a close enough. A close. And then 14 and 15, 14 and 16. Go on. Yeah, I should probably place that slightly closer to the edge. <sighs> Let's see if I can get this one better. That one's a bit better. That one's still looking off. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Just be happy with it. It's on, and it looks, broadly speaking, right, if a bit weird. Broadly speaking, right, if a bit weird. You can't see the stickers, thankfully. Um, so, you know, you can't give me too much. That's fun. When is where is this sticker supposed to go? Where are these stickers supposed to go? Fifteen and sixteen. Fifteen. 14. Thirteen and eleven. No idea where 13 and 11 were supposed to go. I think I managed to miss that somewhere. Oh well. Not too worried. It looks good to me. Let's see if we can't get this on. Now, what should we go with? Let's uh, look up Ferrari wheels, shall we? Or rather, let's look at a box. Mox has those wheels on, so those are the wheels I'm going to go with. You have a choice of starred wheels 
which are kind of cool. I'm going to go with the Star Wheels because I haven't got anything else between Star Wheels. Now, I have all sorts of little systems in here, which I have no idea where they come from, but were not used in any way, shape, or form in a construction. But there we go. It is done. It is complete. And looks good. So, thank you very much for watching. Um, hope you enjoyed that. I said I'm going to go back to redesign, uh, redesigning from the ground up the fleets of Trafalgar. As you can see, I've actually gone back to the previous video to delete stuff completely and start off again. <sighs> Wish me luck. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Ooh, not a brew ship's one. I was using a brew ship set though for us, so I will use it. <laughs>